with you. It is great to be here with you. I have a great affection for the South Dakota district. I've been here now as a seminary professor or pastor under the district presidentships of Vern Schindler and uh, Dale Zatgast and my classmate from St. Louis 1985, Scott Seiler. I can remember speaking at Zion Lutheran Church in Mitchell about 10 years ago. The outdoor temperature was about minus 15 and we had no hot water in our hotel. Anyone remember that experience? Yes, yes, yes. Several of us uh, are still alive. The majority actually died that day. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, right up here, uh, Nabil Noor, the third vice president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Nabil and I are leading a group of people from St. Michael in Fort Wayne in his church in Hartford, South Dakota, uh, to Israel later this year. And uh, Peter Kurowski has been along uh, for the ride uh, in my life uh, for many decades. Uh, so I could go on and on. I actually have seen several of my former students at Concordia Seminary St. Louis who remarkably several of them are still speaking with me. Uh, so it is very good to be here uh, with all of you. I will put all of my cards on the table at the get-go. Isaiah 40 to 55, Isaiah actually is broken up into three sections. Uh, one author, three sections, uh, 1 to 39, uh, 40 to 55, and 56 to 66. And 40 to 55 would be the most significant, most important, most uh, missional, uh, most gospel chapters in the Bible, in the Bible. So that's where I'm coming from uh, this morning and this afternoon. Here is our theme text for my time and obviously the theme text for your convention. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. You can see the words that I've accented in your convention verse, and these will provide the outline for my presentation. First of all, we're going to take a look at Zion and Jerusalem. Uh, those uh, two terms are synonymous. Uh, they both stand for exiles who are in Babylon in the 6th century B.C., the second part of my presentation will be the good news, right? The gospel uh, that is uh, accented twice in your verse. The third part of my presentation, the cities of Judah would be the target of the evangelist, uh, Zion, Jerusalem, with their evangel, good news. And then the fourth part of my presentation will be the actual message of the gospel, behold your God. We will spend the most part of my Bible study on the last section of this verse, Hene uh, Eloheka in Hebrew, uh, behold your God. Susanna Pedroizen heard her daughter cry out, Mommy, I'm thirsty, I want a drink. She and her four-year-old daughter, Gani, were stuck in a basement beneath tons of collapsed concrete and steel. Several dead bodies were crushed alongside of them. It was December 7, 1988. An earthquake in Armenia, a former Soviet Republic, had just killed 55,000 people. Mommy, I'm so thirsty. I want to drink. There was nothing for her mother, Susanna, to give. Susanna was trapped flat on her back. At some point during what seemed to be an eternal night, Susanna remembered watching a TV show about an explorer in the Arctic who was dying of thirst. His comrade slashed his hand open and gave his friend his blood. So after feeling around in the darkness of their basement, Susanna found some shattered glass. She used it to slash her left hand and then gave it to her daughter, Gayani, to suck her blood. Days passed. Susanna had no idea how many times she cut her hands. She only knew that if she stopped, her daughter would die. Hands were cut. Blood was shed. 
and the child was saved. On August 29th, 587 B.C., Judah's world caved in. The temple collapsed. The monarchy lay in ruins. The land became a wasteland and all hope was dismantled and destroyed. Then a massive aftershock of an earthquake brought further wreckage and ruin. What was that? 700 miles from home, Judah's exiles became trapped in a basement called Babylon. In 587, Babylon unearthed Jerusalem from its foundations. Babylon unleashed against Jerusalem their policies of herbicide, that's the destruction of a city's architecture, and ecocide, the wiping out of an environment. The great and mighty fire-breathing dragon called Nebuchadnezzar defeated Judah, and it looked as though it was the triumph of his god, Marduk, over Israel's god, Yahweh. Everything looked as though Yahweh was no match for Marduk. Or perhaps the situation was even worse. What if Yahweh didn't exist? What if Judah's trust in him had been in vain? Or conversely, maybe Yahweh was real and did have the power to defeat Babylon, but Yahweh chose not to do it. Yahweh doesn't care. The preacher's perspective from Ecclesiastes 1 might be the best text when you're stuck in a basement called Babylon. Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. Judah's nightmare appears in the book of Lamentations like a broken record. There is no comforter for Zion, Lamentations 1, verse 2. There was no comforter for her, 1, 9. Far from me is a comforter, 1, 16. There was no comforter for her, 1, 17. There was no comforter for me, 1, 18. How much darker can the dirge become. But Yahweh is not finished with his people. Into the speechless silence, God speaks. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God, not his God, not her God, not their God, not a God, not some God, not any God, your God. Yahweh does an about face. He goes from law to gospel. Into the pain of the basement, Yahweh commands his heavenly messengers. Comfort, comfort my people. It's time for Israel to step out of darkness and into Yahweh's marvelous light. It might strike us as strange that Zion, Jerusalem, these exiles in Babylon are ordered to become Yahweh's means of announcing the good news <laughs> in chapter 40, verse 9. Back to Lamentations chapter 1. It describes the city as a widow and slave, abandoned by friends with no resting place, suffering bitterly, bereft of her children, mocked by her enemies, unclean, despised, rejected, weeping, and without a comforter. Deceived, groaning, and fainting. And folks, that's just chapter 1 of Lamentations. How can a city portrayed like this proclaim the good news to other defeated cities in Judah? How can someone who laments in chapter 49, 14 of the book of Isaiah... Yahweh abandoned me, the Lord forgot me. How can someone like this ever be any good at announcing the gospel? Chapter 40 of Isaiah is an overview 
of the entire unit, chapters 40 to 55, and as such displaying Zion's destination. I will repeat that because that's quite important. Chapter 40 of Isaiah is an overview of the best 16 chapters in the Bible and as such displaying Zion, Jerusalem's destiny. It's not who Zion, Jerusalem is at the moment. It's what Zion, Jerusalem will become. Isaiah 40 verse 9 then states the goal of chapters 41 to 55. Rather than the city's current state, they're anything but evangelists at this point. Yahweh's choice of a wounded Zion as his witness to the gospel may appear to be shocking to us, but its goal is in keeping with the election of the patriarchs, who we are told in Deuteronomy 26.5 are perishing Arameans, matriarchs, who are at one time, all three of them, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, barren. Israel, who was the least of all the people, and climactically Jesus, who is rejected and crucified as a common criminal. So Zion, though lying in a basement called Babylon, in ruins and lamenting Yahweh's absence, will be restored. Then she will be able to get up on a high mountain and announce the good news. As such, Yahweh tells Zion not what she is, but what she will become. This is, by the way, the central message of the Bible. <laughs> it's not who we are, folks. It's what we will become. A similar strategy is in Genesis 17.5, where Yahweh remains of Ram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of many. Genesis 32.28, when Yahweh calls Jacob, liar, trickster, deceiver, that's what Yaakov means in Hebrew, to Yisrael, Israel, let God rule. Simon, as we all know, he calls Petros, Peter, the rock. Here is Zion's final destiny. And this is the center of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations will flow to it. Many people shall come and say, and I call a time out here, all and many, as I've highlighted on the screens, in some cases are synonymous. It's right there. All and many, in some cases, in both testaments, are synonymous. We will come back to this critical point. Continuing with Zion's final destiny, all the nations, many peoples will say, come, let us go to the mountain of, of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go the Torah, the teaching. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between the nations, shall decide disputes for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. That's what you call shalom, peace, restoration. Their spears into pruning hooks. That's why Messiah is called Sar Shalom, right? Prince of Peace in 9 verse 6 in the prophet Isaiah. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations. Neither shall they learn war anymore. This is Zion's final destiny. Talk about an evangelist attracting all the nations and many peoples. So we know a little bit about 
who Zion and Jerusalem are in Isaiah 40, verse 9. The exiles in a basement called Babylon, but Yahweh is not finished with them yet. We move to the second part of my presentation, good news, good news. Gospel first appears in a theological sense in this verse. Now, if that doesn't light your fire, you're working with wet wood. Gospel, the word gospel, basar in Hebrew, oi angelizomai in Greek, appears for the first time theologically in the Bible right here. This, then, is the definition of what gospel means. Free pizza. You're traveling from Sioux Falls to Mitchell, going 95 miles an hour. And you see this sign, free pizza. Oh, who's not going to slow down at least 60 and take a look? <laughs> Free pizza! Isn't this amazing? Who wouldn't stop for free pizza? Let's use this idea to understand what the gospel is and isn't. The gospel is more than free pizza. <laughs> A lot of Christian teaching and preaching is simply free pizza. But that's not the biblical gospel. It's close. It's close. It's not the real deal. No. If we're talking about gospel, the gospel according to Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 9, it's more than just free life, free forgiveness, <laughs> free mercy, free grace. It's so much more than that. No, the biblical gospel, the Isaiah gospel, tells us where the pizza is. It may be <laughs> in North Dakota. Who knew? <laughs> the biblical gospel tells us where it is, right? The biblical gospel tells us who it's for. It may just be for Southern Baptists and not Mo Synod folk. The biblical gospel tells us when it's available. Free pizza between midnight and two every morning on every third Friday after a full moon on the preceding Tuesday. That won't get us very far. The biblical gospel tells us how I get it. So let me fill it out. Where? <laughs> it's in Jesus Christ. When? Until the end of time. Who's it for? <laughs> All people. How do I get it? It's delivered. <laughs> it's delivered, right? <laughs> it's delivered in word and sacrament. Our good news, the biblical good news, the Isaiah good news, tells us where, when, who's it for, and how I get it. Gospel. Let's see what the church has said about Isaiah, who is the prophet of the gospel, often called the fifth evangelist. Jerome wrote of Isaiah, he should be called an evangelist rather than a prophet. Evangelist, gospeler. Because he describes all the mysteries of Christ in the church so clearly that you would think he's composing a history of what has already happened rather than prophesying about what is to come. When the early church father Augustine asked another church father Ambrose for his advice what should I begin in terms of my Bible reading? Ambrose told Augustine, start with Isaiah. Quote, I believe that Isaiah is more plainly a foreteller of the gospel and of all the calling of the Gentiles than all the others. 
John Chrysostom called Isaiah the prophet with the loudest voice. The saving message of Isaiah's gospel, 40 to 55 specifically, its soaring language, its unforgettable imagery are tightly woven not only into the fabric of the New Testament, but Christian hymnody, liturgy, and devotional literature. Christological interpretations of these chapters reach their artistic zenith in George Frederick Handel's Messiah, in which 14 movements come from Isaiah 40 to 55. Matthew sums up the preaching ministry of Jesus with the formula, the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus understands his mission in light of Isaiah 40 to 55. Mark's gospel begins, 1 verse 1, with the noun gospel. <laughs> and then he proceeds to quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 4. Luke Acts would be a New Testament version of Isaiah 40 to 55 and its gospel message. Luke's program is Luke chapter 3, verse 6, where Luke says, All flesh will see the salvation of our God. That's Isaiah 40, verse 5. And Luke is the only synoptic gospeler who quotes Isaiah 40, verse 5. Matthew and Mark. Only Isaiah 43 and 4. And Luke is the only gospeler who in the book of Acts, chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, quotes extensively from Isaiah's fourth servant song in 52, 13 through 53, 12. The book of Romans finds its doctrine of justification by grace through faith from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. My righteous servant will declare many righteous. It's the Pauline program. There it is. And a couple more righteousness verses from chapter 54 of Isaiah. Their righteousness comes from me, and he will sprinkle many nations. And in those cases, you guessed it, many means all. Objective justification. This is what it looks like, the sprinkling, from a Good Friday perspective. The sprinkling that is done by the suffering servant is a sprinkling of blood and water. John 19.34 says that at the Roman spear thrust there was a sudden flow of blood and water. The gospel is then delivered <laughs> through the means of grace. The blood a synecdoche, or a part for the whole, for Holy Communion, the water pointing us to the gift of Holy Baptism. That's how John interprets it in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. In Jesus, then, the gospel is delivered, the gospel is found, the gospel is for all people, and the gospel is until the end of time. So we're getting up on a high mountain with Zion, herald of this gospel that we're talking about. Lift it up in strength, O Jerusalem. Again, Zion and Jerusalem, not what they are right now, but what God is going to do with them, these exiles in Babylon. And they are to take this gospel and declare it to the cities of Judah. Part three. 
Whatever the exact number was, the Babylonian exile left Jerusalem like a ghost town in 587 B.C., with few people living in and around its precincts. After 587 B.C., Israelite families were scattered. Villagers left, lived in cities. The royal class had no palace. The priest had no altar. Everything had been turned upside down and inside out. Despondent and despairing, that's how we would describe the cities of Judah. They're no better than those who are stuck who have been exiled in the basement called Babylon. Between Iron Age, this would be 1200 B.C. and 550 B.C., and the Persian period from 549 B.C. to 333 B.C., Jerusalem and her neighboring villages declined by 90%. The land of Judah fell by 70% in its population. Right between <laughs> Iron Age and Persian period, it all came coming down. This would mean that the region closest to Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, suffered a mortal blow at the end of Iron Age by Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and his chief butcher called Nebuzaradan. This caused the evacuation of most of its population. Think scorched earth policy. This region was not settled again until the Persian times, we understand that, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and even then recovered only partially and in limited fashion. Another indication of the extent of the damage. During the Persian era, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Jerusalem's population was about 3,000. 12% of the population of the city and its environs, environs on the eve of the Babylonian destruction. The cities of Judah are the target of the gospel. They're broken and hurting. They've gone from 25,000 living in Jerusalem to 3,000. But Yahweh also wants the nations to hear the gospel. All are broken and hurting. Generally speaking, most Christians mistakenly believe that God's concern for all people, not just the cities of Judah, but all the nations, begins in places like Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, 24 to, uh, 44 to 49, and John 20, verse 21, often Great Commission chapters, verses, text of the Bible. As though it's only in Jesus that God reaches out to the nations. Yahweh's concern for all people doesn't begin in the New Testament. In fact, it doesn't even begin in Isaiah. But most certainly, Isaiah 40 to 55 is where it picks up steam. Where does it begin? It begins in Genesis chapter 12. Yahweh said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. After this, in verse 2, there are seven lines. Seven, perfect number. And, quite often in Hebrew writings, the author will put the meat of his composition in the middle. So let's count it out. I'll make you into a great nation, that's one. I'll bless you, that's two. I'll make your name great, that's three. Right in the middle, and by the way, this is an imperative, be a blessing. That's the point. Five. I will bless those who bless you. Six, whoever curses you, I will curse. And seven, all, all families on the earth will be blessed through you. 
This, sisters and brothers, is the Great Commission. The first one. And it's perfect. It's the platform. It sets everything missionally going in the Bible. Of Ram, later called Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, later called Israel, and their offspring are called to become a leaven among the nations, a wellspring of living water, a constant invitation for Gentiles to learn the saving deeds of Yahweh. The nation is Yahweh's missionary to the world. And as I said in Isaiah, it picks up steam. The glory of Yahweh will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. To reiterate, these are the most missional chapters in the Old Testament, 40 to 55. There's more. 49.6. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. 52.10, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> Come, all who are thirsty. Isaiah calls the exiles to testify to the world that Yahweh longs for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For example, up there on the screen, 43.10, you're my witnesses. 44.8, fear not, nor be afraid. Have I told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. And for obvious reasons, my favorite verse in the book of Isaiah. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. There are billions of bruised reeds and smoldering wicks in the world. You see, we in the West watch recessions come and we watch recessions go. But for the two-thirds world, recessions don't come and go. They just come. They never go. And they keep coming. Every seven seconds, a child under the age of five dies of hunger. Forty-five people, 4,500 people today in Africa will die of AIDS. One in seven children in our world, that's 158 million, went to work today. And they will go to work every day just to survive. 40% of the world lake lacks basic sanitation. 1.6 billion people have no electricity. Nearly 1 billion people in the world can't read or write or sign their name. Almost 1 billion people in the world live on less than one American dollar a day. Another 2.5 billion people around the world live on less than two American dollars per day. And so more than half of the world, half of the world, lives on less than two bucks a day. Tonight, 480 million people will go to bed hungry, some even starving, because they can't afford a single meal. This year, in the world, one million people will commit suicide. These broken reeds, smoldering wicks, these hurting masses in every country, in every city, in every village need what Isaiah 40 to 55 offers. And what we have, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. 
But there is another kind of suffering in the world, and it is the worst kind of suffering. It is the suffering of hopelessness, the suffering of guilt and sin, the suffering of brokenness and shame, and it all leads to eternal suffering. Oh, how Yahweh longs to awaken us so that we awaken those who need the message of salvation by grace through faith in the only God, the crucified God, Jesus, who died and rose again. Please understand, when you and I get a glimpse of the physical and spiritual suffering of this world, whether through study or travel or some of the statistics I just shared, it can quickly lead to guilt. Guilt isn't helpful. Guilt doesn't change lives. Guilt doesn't drive the mission. Honesty is helpful. Awareness is helpful. Knowledge is helpful. Guilt isn't. We won't make a difference with the attitude, well, I guess someone's got to do it. We won't bring the best of our mercy ministry or the best of our gospel message if we're muttering under our breath, well, okay, no. We will change the world one life at a time when we behold our God. Part four. Zion and Jerusalem still crushed under collapsed steel and girders in a basement called Babylon. Zion and Jerusalem commissioned, called, enlivened, empowered to be the herald of good news. The target, the cities of Judah, yes, but beyond Isaiah 40 verse 9, all the nations. And what will be the message? You know, behold your God. The word behold in many English versions sometimes is scrapped. It sounds archaic, King James-ish. But the ESV is one translation, keeps all of the beholds. That's important. Hold on to the beholds. Behold denotes immediacy, commands attention to an event that is newsworthy or unexpected. Behold means take note. This is the main point. Look here. Obviously in antiquity, they didn't have the ability to raise the font size, use underline, or use bold. So what did they use? They used behold, hine. In Hebrew, edu, in New Testament Greek. Behold your God. This takes us back to Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, where we have this covenant formula for the first time. I will be your God and you will be my people. And in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, as we already saw, Comfort, comfort, my people, says <laughs> your God. There are many other gods to choose from, but Israel has been claimed and saved and delivered by this God, your God, who has a name, <laughs> Yahweh. But stuck in Babylon, they had a full menu of gods to choose from. The Babylonian Empire began in 626 BC under the leadership of Nabu Palazar. It ended in 539 BC with the demise of its last king, Nabonidus, and his son, Belshazzar. Babylon, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Babylon, it's Akkadian. A cousin of Hebrew, 
It means gate of the gods, folks. The empire claimed to be the new nerve center of the universe, the very gate to heaven. You want God, we got them, all 2,000 in our pantheon. As Judean exiles entered Babylon through this Ishtar gate, you can go and see it today in Berlin, Germany. There it is, the real deal. They would walk onto the great processional way, and they stepped on imported limestone slabs that were inscribed with the phrase, to the honor of Marduk. A disclaimer needs to be made at this point. Not Mar Maduk. That's a comic strip dog. Marduk is the chief god in the Babylonian pantheon of, as I said, over 2,000 gods. Marduk, it was claimed in Babylonian texts, was the creator of the universe. And king, this is big, he's the king of the universe. In fact, they would often say in different rituals in Babylon, Marduka Masuru, which when interpreted means Marduk is king. In the empire's propaganda machine, we have these lines from their creation account called the Enuma Elish. You, Marduk, are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your word is unrivaled. From this day unchangeable shall be your pronouncement. To raise or bring low, those shall be in your hand. Your utterance shall be true. Your command shall be impeachable, unimpeachable. Now, if you're still with me, you notice that this piece of the Enuma Elish focuses upon the word of Marduk, his pronouncement, his utterance, and his command. What frames the best 16 chapters in the Bible? The efficacy, the power, the living quality of the word of not Marduk, <laughs> Yahweh. 40 verse 8, right? Verbum dei monet and aeternum, as we know from celebrating Ref 500. The word of our Lord endures forever. Isaiah 40 to 55 is a countercultural document against the Enuma Elish and everything it stands for. And how does Isaiah end the best 16 chapters? You know, chapters 55, 10, 11. Yahweh's word <laughs> will not return empty. The empire, though, had a well-organized and well-oiled machine to conform exiles to their new reality. Marduka Masuru. Marduk is king. Just ask Hananiah, Misael, and Azariah about the Babylonian propaganda machine. Or maybe you know them by their Veggie Tales names, Shackrack and Benny. Some affectionately call them your shack, my shack, and a bungalow. But in Daniel 1.7, the empire changes their names to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the ancient Near East, changing names signified a change of identity, a change of destiny, a change of character. Parallels are in Pharaoh's renaming Joseph in Genesis 41-45. And Nebuchadnezzar's new name for Judah's last king, Mataniah, who's changed to Zedekiah in 2 Kings 24-17. This renaming of Hananiah, Misael, and Azariah, those are their Hebrew names, to Shachrach and Benny, <laughs> was an attempt to oppose the ideology and polytheistic worldview of Babylon on these young Judeans. The events in Daniel 3 with Nebuchadnezzar's statue in the fiery furnace indicated that Shachrach and Benny, 
they refused to blend in, bow down, or sell out. Even though <laughs> the heat was on. Slowly but surely, though, most of the exiles in Babylon began to accommodate themselves to their new surroundings. They were unmoved by Isaiah's poetic claims, alarming narrative, and stunning doxology. In fact, in economic documents unearthed in Tel El Marasu on the Tigris River, these ancient documents show that blending in with Babylon brought with it stunning financial success. Get it? Go along and get rich living comfortably in a place of destruction and death, that basement? Oh, it became a new way of life. Maybe it's not that bad after all. It was the whole boiling frog syndrome, you know, right? It's said that if a frog is placed in hot water, it will jump out. But if it is placed in lukewarm water that is gradually heated, it will never get out but slowly die. Isaiah 40 to 55 indicates that most of the exiles began calling Babylon their new normal. They were in hot water. If they don't get out soon, they will die. That's why Throughout chapter 48 of the prophet Isaiah, he calls these people stuck in the basement of Babylon, and I quote, stubborn, unyielding, headstrong, prone to idolatry, deaf, deceptive, and a stubborn rebel from birth. All of this is because Israel refused to listen. Shema. That's the Hebrew word for listen, the governing word of Isaiah chapter 48. It appears 11 times in Isaiah chapter 48. Shema, listen, never obey. That's not what it word means, although sometimes translated obey. No, Shema means listen. Listen, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Akkad. Faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, verse 16. They didn't listen. And if we don't listen, we lose faith. Can't you just imagine people responding to the prophet Isaiah? Isaiah, haven't you heard? Babylon is the political, military, religious superpower of the world. This is the land of life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. Why should we go back to little backwater Judah? 3,000 people in Jerusalem? Ha! Ah, sounds like a triple parish in South Dakota. Besides, what a huge hassle it would be to liquidate all our assets, pack our bags, pull up stakes, just to live in a land devastated by herbicide and ecocide, right? Scorched earth. Get out of Babylon? Isaiah, have you lost your mind? Get lost. This is like a thirsty person choosing to drink raw sewage instead of water from a mountain stream. This is like a bankrupt company rejecting a generous government bailout. The captives wouldn't leave their captivity. The lights of Babylon, the sounds of Babylon, and the religion of Babylon coax most of them into staying in Babylon. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 10 and 11 is the classic response to the prophetic call. What do they say? Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Stop confronting us with Kadosh Israel, the Holy One of Israel, a title Isaiah uses 19 times in his book. 
for, uh, for Yahweh. What compromises the gospel? What compromises the mission? What erodes your faith and mine in a word? You got it. Idolatry. Idolatry among the exiles. Their fascination with Babylonian deities undercut their witness to the world to prove his point. Isaiah takes us on a tour of an idol factory. To get some perspective, I need to take you to a Build-A-Bear workshop. So please bear with me, <laughs> pun intended. Back in 1997, Maxine Clark opened the first Build-A-Bear workshop at the Galleria Shopping Center in St. Louis, M.O. Now there are over 300 workshops worldwide. If you've never been to a Build-A-Bear workshop with five screaming and squealing seven-year-old children, all who are on a sugar high from birthday cake and Code Red Mountain Dew, let me tell you the rules. First, you choose from over 30 models of bears. Second, you take your bear and stuff it, stitch it, fluff it, dress it, accessorize it, and name it. The result? <laughs> your very own bear. Your bear has been born. To prove it, you're given a customized birth certificate and has only cost $149.76. So what you conceived in your mind, you've built with your hands, you've chosen what it looks like, and you've personalized your own bear with your own preferences. It's just what you always wanted in a bear. It's your creation. Ta-da! Building a bear is a lot like building your own God. That's the point. Isaiah escorts us into a bona fide Babylonian build a God workshop. And here it is. Isaiah 40 to 48 has more to say about idolatry than any part of the Bible bar none. Here's a build a God workshop. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in the form of a man, a man in all his glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cut down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest and planted a plate, pine. And the rain made it grow. He fashions a God and worships it. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my God. Just as Israel liked to build gods, so there is in a part of all of us something that, let us just say, we have called creative craftsmanship. We don't build bears. We build gods. We conceive them in our mind. We build them with our hands. We choose what they look like. We personalize them with our preferences. It's just what we want in a God. It's a God who likes what I like, who hates what I hate, who shares my opinion, who votes the same way I do. It's a God who increases my standard of living and happiness. This is a God who gives me what I want and stays out of the way most of the time. John Calvin famously states that the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. Commenting on the first commandment, Luther says in his large catechism, that to which your heart clings and entrusts itself is, I say, really your God. Just who are these gods that these exiles are building in their build a God workshop? Stay tuned. That's part two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reed. Oh, thank you.